Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening for a special World Refugee Day panel. As many of you may know, June 20th, which is next Monday, um, is World Refugee Day. It also happens to be my 37th birthday. Um, trust me, I'm not worried of those numbers that are piling up on my years, but I am very excited for the cupcakes and pies that all my friends will be bringing over to my apartment. It's actually also one of my favorite days so who doesn't say no to all this delicious and sweet stuff especially with someone who has a sweet tooth all right so world refugee day is um, an international day designated by the united nations to honor refugees around the globe we celebrate the strength and courage of people who have been forced to flee their home country to escape conflict or persecution this day is also an occasion to build empathy and understanding for the plight of refugees and to recognize their resilience in building their lives. This is a critical time of our life. At the end of 2021, last year, 89.3 million people were forced to flee their beloved home. Now, this year, in 2022, that number has become 100 million people displaced globally. Yes, 100 million people are now displaced all around the world. One in every 75 people on earth has been forced to flee. This actually is a dramatic milestone that few would have expected a decade ago. So tonight, we will be featuring three of those who were once in that number and the status, but were able to rebuild their lives from scratch. Now, distinguished authors and activists who are all former refugees, now brown Americans, they will be discussing their lives, careers, and black refugee experience in the United States. The stories of these individuals inspire all of us, either here at CWS or in the United States or around the world. And they are why we work so hard to ensure that everyone has a chance to live their own story in safety and dignity. Now, let me go ahead and start introducing our panelists. I will start with Shukri Abdurrahman. Shukri is a Refugee Congress delegate from Maine. She is a resettled refugee who came to the United States in 2009. Shukri is now a proud graduate of the university of Maine at Farmington. She majored in international global studies and anthropology. I was looking on something that Shukri posted on her Facebook on May 7th this year, which was the same day as her graduation. She wrote, Alhamdulillah, praise be to God, praise be to God. Through all the obstacles, I managed to be the first person in my family to graduate. I am happy to be graduating with three majors in international and global studies, anthropology, and political science. Well, congratulations, Shukri. Shukri is also an activist, and she has been an activist for more than five years and is committed to making sure resources are available in new Americans in a culturally appropriate manner. As a former refugee, she understands the struggles and challenges Black women face in her free time. Sorry, um, those are the challenges that, that uh, Shukri tackles. And then when she's free, she enjoys doing crea creative art and writing poetry. She also likes hiking and playing soccer. Let's see. So that is Shukri. Since we still don't have Habso, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, or read the bio of Habib, and then we can dive into the questions that I have for you guys tonight. <clears throat> Habib is actually, an author as well, and you may see his um, book come up. Um, he's from Ivory Coast, and um, and then to a career as an American physician, Habib. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And yeah, author, yeah, <laughs> perfect. And he's he's the author of a memoir that I have read from page to page. A gazelle ate my homework, and um, in this memoir, Habib tells of his uh, movement across continents cultures and identities. Habib's journey to become an American is beset by persistent internal questions. 
which he attacks with the same rigor he brings to his medical schooling. What does it mean to be a Muslim, a Christian, an agnostic, or even maybe an atheist? What does it mean to be an African in America? Well, as he navigates the shifting waters of cultural identity, he's forced to confront his own prejudice about religion, about the marginalized communities, and ultimately about himself. Along the way, he learns what to do when you fall into a well, why you can't carry a sword on canvas, and how to treat a patient who thinks you are the cleaning stuff. I love that one. <laughs> All right. Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and read Hapsa's um, bio, and then I apologize, and then we can go ahead and ask the questions, um, and hopefully Hapsa will just be on board soon. Um, Hapsa is an award-winning writer, educator, and a former refugee. Um, you may see her, the book, the cover of her book as well. Um, she proudly calls herself a Minnesotan and a lifelong learner. Born in a Kenyan refugee camp, which is, by the way, the same camp that I have also lived um, temporarily, but now Hapso is fortunate enough to, uh, to have immigrated to the United States, where she devotes much of her time and energy to advocate for children who share her background as a refugee. She firmly stands up for all the children who have become so marginalized in the educational system that they lack equal access to a good education and a bright future. Hapso obliged to combine causes that, that paint her with her skills and talent through storytelling. Now, she's a tutoring author and educator for Fox on mental health, identity, and representation. Her story or her storytelling is breaking barriers and Hapso is globally recognized for her creativity in communicating to those who are unseen, unheard, and misunderstood. And uh, I am Abdi Eftin. I am the uh, CWS Communication Specialist on Welcoming Communities. And of course, I will be moderating this wonderful panel tonight. Um, and um, well, I used to be a refugee myself in Kenya for over five years. And um, I'm also an author like Habib. Um, then now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to this timely conversation that we titled Unraveling the Black Refugee Narrative. Habib and Shukri, well, thank you so much for joining. Now, um, Shukri, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Now, briefly tell us what you do and where you're originally from. Oh, thank you for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. So for me, I would say originally I am from Kenya. I was born into the Dag refugee camp and was there up until I was nine years old. And we got resettlement to the U.S. That's when my family came to the United States. Um, I've been in Maine ever since the refugee camp. Grew up here, had my education here. And for what I do for work or just in my what I believe in and work towards would be just helping, you know, minorities and like refugees adapt to the United States. And which is just like, I work as a case manager for Catholic Charities and we help with like basic necessities, um, learning about the American workforce, the resources that are available to refugees and making sure that like culturally appropriate services are provided to the people. And um, yeah, making sure that language is not so much of a barrier and that there is something being done to be able to combat these issues. Wonderful. Um, Shukri, by the way, uh, you, you have been organizing in the summer of 2020, you organized a few um, rallies across Maine. Uh, if anybody actually Googles your, uh, your photos, um, some of those amazing pictures of you leading a whole crowd of people, um, come up. Can you talk a little bit about that experience, how how you have as a young um, woman, how you really decided to stand up and rally your community um, for justice and equality? Thank you for that. Um, in 20, June 2020, that's when I organized the Black Lives Matter protest. It was like 
just basically I saw a bunch of protests and people standing up across the world. And for me, I remember just watching that video of George Floyd being murdered. And I watched that video seven times. It made me cry. It made me angry. It made me just think about the world. It made me think about what I was doing to deal with the problem that's at hand right now. And I just remember being like woken up basically. That was like, that was a tipping moment for me because, you know, injustices have been happening all over the United States and black men continue to die at the hands of police brutality. So for me, that event was just like uh, added on event where I just couldn't take it anymore. And I felt like I had to take action and do something about this. And the best way I knew to take action was just speaking to people who are educated on these topics, um, working with you know community members and just, I never organized a protest before. This was my first time ever like being involved in protest or like organizing one. So I just remember speaking to people that I knew who stand up for justice, who have been part of protests before. And I reached out to them and they were very helpful in like just being there for me and telling me that, you know, this is something you're passionate about, you should go for it. And I was able to organize this protest where over 700 people showed up. And I just started attending all of the protests that were taking place in Maine. And um, from the protests, there were teachings occurred, people started talking about these issues and, you know, and I just felt like this was something that needed to happen and it happened. And I'm glad that I was able to experience something so like moving and inspiring. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Habib, now tell us what you do and where you are originally from, my friend. Okay. Well, thank you for your introduction. Um, I was born in Ivory Coast, uh, in West Africa, known as Cote d'Ivoire in French. Uh, former French colony used to be a place of uh, political stability for most of uh, the post-independence period, that's from 1960 onwards. Uh, starting about in the late 90s, there started being uh, this inter-ethnic strife where politicians decided that it was much easier to get to power by pitting one ethnic group against another in a you know replay of something that's happened all over our continent, unfortunately. Um, and it was a slow, long, almost inexorable slide towards civil war. Um, by the time we left, uh, the civil war hadn't quite started. But you know, if people, if you could read the tea leaves, so to speak, you could see that uh, stability was going to be a thing of the past pretty soon. And so we left. Hopefully, thankfully, my immediate family escaped about six months before the actual fighting started. Um, but the war ended up lasting about ten years. Um, anyway, I came here. And uh, initially, uh, it was a long time before I was going to the asylum. Uh, it was about five years. Uh, my first career was a nurse. Um, I worked for three years as a nurse. And then when I was, uh, I was basically using my earnings to pay for my pre-med classes. And after a few years of that, I applied to med school. I was able to get in at the University of Iowa. Uh, and today I work as a rehabilitation specialist. Um, I'm the medical director of an inpatient rehab unit uh, in uh, Eugene, Oregon. Um, so yeah, that's my story. Wonderful. Now I, I have in this uh, question. <clears throat> Obviously, um, we are celebrating, um, World Refugee Day, of course, um, ahead of time because we will all be very busy on the 20th, right? <laughs> We're going to be doing a lot of different things. Um, yeah. I assume I'm going to be celebrating my birthday as well. But it's a, it's a good reminder for all of us that World Refugee Day actually um, uh, happened or was officially recognized on December 4, and the year was the 2000. And um, the United Nations General Assembly uh, basically passed that resolution expressing solidarity with Africa, particularly uh, coinciding with Africa Refugee Day. So that's pretty special for, for us, and this is why we need it a uh, panel that um, reflects, you know, um, those stories. And in the last few months, obviously, um, and this is um, a question that I will start with Shukri. In the last few months, Ukraine and Afghanistan have basically been all over the news. And we have heard a lot of their stories uh, published and documented um, wherever you look. Now, as a Black woman uh, educated in this country, in the state of Maine. Shukri, what does World Refugee Day actually mean to you? You look at it. 
Thank you. That is a good question, I would say. For me, World Refugee Day means honoring those who show resiliency, even though they have faced many hardships. It's a day to celebrate, you know, um, many people who have gone through different, like who have faced many obstacles and they are here today and they are striving and they are working towards building a better future for their families and themselves. So World Refugee Day, it's a day that I think it's important to recognize refugees and um, their history and not only just focus on their struggles, but to focus on their strength and like the amazing things that refugees have brought upon, you know, since ever since they started um, immigrating to other countries. So I would say it, this day is very special to me and it's a, it's a day to just a reminder of where, you know, who I am as a person and um, it just allows me to look back and reflect on my experience as well as recognizing other people's um, refugee journey experience. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I assume that uh, folks like us actually have a few more layers of, you know, extra obstacles and challenge that you that you obviously face. Um, for example, uh, with all the movements that's happening in the continent of Africa, not even talking about foreign involvement in our governments that may also be forcing people, you know, to flee and leave their places. But when we talk about here in the United States, you're sometimes finding, and this is something I also experienced, finding yourself in, in between a rock and a heart service. Um, do you have to worry about racism as it is, as we talk about, which obviously is, I think, undisputable, something that really does exist? Or do you sometimes really um, find yourself the challenge of how do you resolve the refugee crisis that is not only, that has not only displaced you and your close family, but is tearing apart, you know, the country that you come from um, and um, all the other stories. So. Do, do you, um, back to Shukri again, do you see those layers um, as becoming a burden on you as you walk through your experiences in the United States? Um, I would say race definitely comes into play, um, regardless of whether you're a refugee coming from um, like a predominantly white country or, you know, a refugee coming from North Africa, East Africa, um, but definitely, I would say this is like a more so of a personal question. <laughs> well, um, the opinion. Oh, it is. <laughs> the opinion could like I guess vary depending on who you ask. But if it was up to me and for me to be honest as an individual and sh just based off of my experience and what I've learned so far in this world, I would say um, black refugees are not you know put at the same level as white refugees and that's just the reality and we can just see i work as a refugee agency right now and i always see the different groups of immigrants and you know their unique you know attributes and um the different like policies that are signed for different people and um in the united states it's a huge problem because i would say there's an influx of refugees there's different there's different categories of refugees. You know, we have the, the UN declaration of what a refugee is, which is just a person who is persecuted, you know, who is facing persecution or, you know, that are fleeing their home country. But there's also a different category, a new emerging category of refugees, which is climate refugees. And that's not really being talked about as much, which is just, okay, these are people that are fleeing their homes, not, not to conflict or political reasons, but climate reasons and uh yeah. i would just say with the whole you know ukrainian crisis right now a lot of people fleeing ukraine and seeking asylum and refuge in other countries that's also a huge problem that's happening in the world but at the same time there's also a lot of people at the america u.s mexico border right now with different groups of people for example you have you know people that are coming from Russia that are at the Ukraine, I mean, at the US-Mexico border at the moment. And some of those people are not being let in and not being granted, you know, statuses. You have different people, you have prioritization of different people that are being, you know, given into certain status. And um, I don't think that's fair. And I think 
um, regardless of your color. It doesn't matter what your color is. As a refugee, you are a refugee and you need to be granted the same rights as any other refugee would be granted. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Habib, does World Refugee Day mean anything to you? Yeah, so um, kind of what uh, should be touched on, there, um, there's going to be more and more refugees uh, in the coming decades, right? Part of it is that we've never had so many people on the planet. Part of it is that there's going to be a lot of climate-based um, havoc that's wreaked on coastal communities and many other places around the world, where if, especially if we have two or three degrees warmer weather, um, a lot of places are going to become uninhabitable. And part of it is going to be um, whenever there is some kind of man-made conflict, uh, like a war, uh, again, countries have, have never had such large populations, so there's going to be that many more people in this place. The other thing uh, to mention is that these people are going to have to go somewhere, and there are a lot of countries in the world, a lot of countries that are doing very well right now, that have unfavorable demographic profiles, by which I mean that their birth rates are below the replacement rate. So without an influx of immigrants, without an influx of refugees, uh, they're not going to be able to sustain their economies because you're going to get to a point where you're going to have many more retirees than active workers. And part of what prevents many nations from bringing in more people is prejudice against people who look different, who sound different, who uh, pray differently, who dress differently. And prejudice that also makes people, especially when those refugees in question are coming from Africa, imagine that uh, we're beggars. We're going to come here and uh, be grifters and moochers. We're going to come here and give people diseases. Uh, we're going to come here and give people AIDS. We're going to come here and not work hard. And sometimes you get this paradoxical um, bigotry where people think that on one hand, you're going to be a moocher and not work hard. And on the other hand, you're also going to steal their job, right? Like somehow you're, you're both a thief because you're going to take people's jobs, but also someone who's not going to do anything to make the country stronger. So to me, World Refugee Day is a way to give people the opportunity to see people who are former asylum seekers and refugees and say, hey, I look at me. I'm not a monster. I'm not going to you know, commit crimes. Uh, I'm going to come here and be a productive member of society, and I will hopefully leave uh, this nation that was kind enough to become a host nation to me. I'm going to leave it in a stronger state um, than it was if it would have been, you know, uh, to a small extent, of course, uh, if it hadn't uh, taken me in. It's an encouragement and an exhortation to give people who are in need a chance to succeed. And by helping those people succeed, you end up actually making your country stronger. Uh, there's not a finite pool of resources out there that if you take this one person in, he's going to eat part of the pie and then you yourself won't get to eat. You get more immigrants, more refugees. You give them a chance to achieve their maximum educational and economic potential, and you get a wealthier nation in the end. So that that's what World Refugee Day means to me. You know... I I know that the three of us um, have a firsthand experience of what being a refugee feels like, uh, and um, you know those. They, and I think you might agree with me on this. I'm very sure of that that when you are refugee in most countries other than the United States, because you don't usually become a refugee in this country, they don't have all the services, but other countries, right? Turkey, Kenya, and other places. I was one of those half a million refugees living in Kenya. And one lesson I learned was, you know, as a refugee, was that I don't see myself as a refugee. It's just always a reminder by if you run into a police or if you run into a system that you have to say that you're a refugee. But when you're with your community, with your friends, you're just a complete human. You know, mm -hmm. you're going out uh, partying, I'm sorry, but we went out getting tea as well, you know, lunch, dinner, hanging out with friends. We kind of do everything that any human on the planet does. So there's a huge misunderstanding of, I would say, maybe half of this country, right? Maybe half of the world, uh, those who have never experienced refugee, that they assume it's just a bunch of people that have certain, you know, characters or, you know, things like that. But that's not true. It's actually that, that human side of it's missing. 
Um, for this, uh, for the panel tonight, I actually um, went back to my email and pulled out a, um, na uh, sorry, 2011 August when I first got my uh, uh, UNHCR document. Um, I'm not going to show it, but I'm going to read what it says so that people who are watching us tonight um, who would be wondering, what does a refugee even mean? Like when you are there at the refugee camp, like what do you have, right? In this country, we have a driving license or a state ID or, or a passport, things like that. I have here a letter called Mandate, and it is given by the United Nations um, High Commission for Refugee. And it usually has uh, what they call um, a reference number and eligibility decision number as well, <laughs> which sort of shows that you have been you have become eligible to become a refugee and that's one step i found that many americans don't even know people experience right um, and then it reads something like this this is to certify that the bearer of this letter is a prima facie refugee under the unhcr mandate um, and then depends on where you are mine was in kenya and then they say the validity of this letter expires you know, there's a date there, and mine definitely expired in 2013, but I moved to the United States in 2014. Um, and then it says, please extend to this person recognition of all rights and, and obligations obtained in the Refugee Act of 2006, the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees and the 1969 OUI convention uh, OUI is, I believe, Union of Af African Union, the, the one that existed before the one we have now, um, aspects of refugee prob uh, problems in Africa. And then it says, should you have any queries regarding this case, please do not hesitate to contact the protection delivery unit at UNHCR branch um, in Nairobi. And this is where I was. The reason I am reading this for everyone watching tonight is I questioned myself many times for the few years that I had this um, in my, you know, in my pack pocket. It's like, why do I have it if it's not accepted? You know, if it's not as powerful as a driving license, because as a driving license, uh, police stops you, you show it. They, they're not, they're not going to question your eligibility or anything like that. But I was wondering with this paper, why was I handcuffed more than 20 times? You know, why was I getting into trouble? So it's a reminder that a refugee, wherever you are on this planet, there are challenges that no other human can actually experience. And that is something we all um, have to remember. Now, I, I, um, I'm more excited to ask more questions here. Thanks uh, to both of you for um, telling us what World Refugee Day actually means. And by the way, I'll remind you that Eiffel Tower, I think we all know in Paris, and the Empire State in New York, and probably many other buildings around the world in Geneva and other places, they will all be lighting blue um, the night of, of the 20th. Not for my birthday, don't be excited. This is, uh, they will do that for World Refugee Day. All right. Um, let me go ahead and ask Shukri. Um, I'm sorry that Hapso did not join us. I don't know, I haven't heard anything from her, but I think we're doing good. Just the three of us. Um, Jibri, what is your experience as a refugee? I, I know we all have those, you know, those experiences. It could be, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be painful. Sometimes I say, I miss hanging out with my friends as a refugee. Like there were those happy moments as well. So what's your experience as a refugee? Can you, can you also at the same time walk us through the challenge that you, that you have faced, if one or two or three, or whatever you can remember? And then I will ask Habib as well. Um, I would say um, my experience as a refugee would be, it's pretty an interesting story, I would say, because um, I remember I didn't know I was a refugee until I came to the United States and went to elementary school. <laughs> and I was called a refugee. I went back to the apartment and I Googled what a refugee was. And there it was, the refugee, the picture of the refugee camp. And for me, that was just it was like when I first looked at that and seen the refugee from a bigger, like a different image and like on a computer. And this was my home as a kid. I didn't think I was in a refugee camp. I thought that was my home. I had my family. I had my friends. 
Um, my friends and I had a lot of freedom where we went out in the camp and explored everywhere. And there was not a lot of like um, parental supervision or control. So um, my friends and I always just, we went everywhere in the refugee camp. We wanted to know the different groups that were there. We wanted to know what other, how far away from the camp we could go. Um, other neighboring like, you know, towns or cities that were nearby. And I remember just being a very, very curious kid in the refugee camp and like just appreciating. And I always, always, always looked forward to um, any time there was an event that was like with the UN or, you know, the ration days where people would come and like, you know, people would line up, make these long, long, nice, long lines with their ration cards and these ration cards served as like it, they were they meant a lot like if you lost yours it meant you just had to wait you know a couple weeks months just to get it back for you to be able to get food these were basically holy cards that you had to just keep safe because this meant that every month your box of miracles would come and those miracles included pasta um oil basic basic things for your survival and I just remember just being, always being in line for that. And like, just, I don't know, my experience as a kid, there was also a lot of like, you know, the bad parts as the refugee camp where, you know, where you see people getting killed, people fighting each other, um, sexual abuse, all of these things as a kid, you witness them, but at the same time, you don't really know them or understand them until you're older. So you're just kind of like, you just kind of grow up living with that and seeing those things and just it makes you just who you are and like I just learned to kind of cope with it I just kind of I appreciate you know my home the that the refugee camp was my home and I appreciate everything that I feel like it made me who I am today and I would have I don't know where my life would be if it wasn't for that experience and Shabir, let me ask you quickly what was your favorite pastime and was it the dub Yes, I was in yeah Hagadera the W. Hagadera. So what was your what was your favorite pastime? My favorite pastime. Playing greed, maybe. I used to yeah we used to play rocks and I was also not the normal kid or the normal girl in the refugee camp because I used to love watching soccer. So my uncles would play soccer. So my favorite thing to do was like sneak at the um, soccer field and watch those games. Uh, I would sneak into movie theaters where it was just mostly men watching these movies. I just remember just doing things that I was not supposed to do. <laughs> and just that's how I got to experience like what was happening in the bigger world. And when I went to those movie theaters, they would show like action movies. They were watching action movies of America. And like you could see these commercials and I was all fascinated. And that was my experience of like just learning and seeing things as a kid. <laughs> Wonderful, really appreciate it. Habib, what's your experience as a former refugee and can you walk us through some of the challenges you have faced? Okay, so my experience is a bit unconventional. Um, as someone who left before the war actually started. Um, so what people do many in those circumstances quite often is get to the country where you're going to get any way you can and then apply for asylum. Like in our case, that means we came with visitor visas and then we got here and we had apply for asylum, we thought it would be an easy process once we said, hey, this is the situation. Uh, but it turned out to be a lot more complicated than that with denials and appeals along the way. Um, what was hard is uh, twofold, well, multiple things. Number one was the language barrier. Uh, I had spoken French all my life. I had my African language as well, but mostly my family would spoke French. And uh, all of a sudden I had to speak a new language that I had taken some classes in, but certainly I was certainly not fluent in. Um, and it was one thing to, you know, learn to do math or in English, because mostly the terms were the same uh, from French to English. But things like history, literature, and all those things, uh, I found that I went from being a really good student who could, you know, study easily and, 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 and get good grades to someone who I felt like was back to being in elementary school again because everything that, that I could read was so much simpler. And with spoken English, it was even more complicated because then whenever people said something to me, I would have to uh, translate it word by word, try to think about what it meant in French, think about my answer in French, translate it word by word, you know, and scramble to put the words in the right order in English. It was it was very complicated. So that is uh, 
that's one of the on the lighter end, end of things, but um, that's definitely one of the challenges. Another challenge for me was to know, am I going to be able to stay here? Um, because you know, I had this case for political asylum that was in the court. Sometimes I would hear, you know, denial and would appeal. I was very young at the time. I was 15 years old. So when I, when I, this was in 2001, by the way, that we moved here. Um, and it felt very challenging to tell yourself to work hard, to get good grades in school, to get a degree, if you could even find a way to pay for the degree. That was not a challenge because we're very poor. When you weren't sure you weren't going to get kicked out in the middle of your class, like I had this um, this thought at all times that like, you know, I've been the car my parents, maybe somebody, uh, you know, maybe it would be a broken taillight, maybe the cop would stop us for anything. And then I would just be shamefully hauled out of, you know, the car or that somebody would come knock at the school and just haul me away and say, you know, he shouldn't be here, that kind of thing. You know, I, I felt for many, many years that I was just always two steps away from being kicked out of the country. Um, and when I finally got granted asylum after five years, it was probably, I don't think I've ever experienced one day in my life that was hype happier. And it sounds like a cliche, but it was, I'd been living with this much distress constantly. You know, the last thing you think about before you go to bed is, am I going to be able to stay here? The first thing you think about is, okay, I hope I, hope I don't get kicked, kicked out today, you know. Uh, I hope they're not going to tell me no and I have to leave. Um, that was that was challenging, just trying to keep yourself motivated to study, uh, to, well, you know, to make a living when you can be, you know, removed from the country at any time. So, yeah, um, absolutely. You know, it, it's it's uh, our country, the United States has, has been through um has been through a few years where I think the three of us have experienced. Um, I remember the election of November uh, 2016. Um, I woke up and I called my boss in the morning. And I said, I'm not coming, you know. And the question that came was like, why? Why are you not coming? You know, I, I said, I'm not even sure if I'm going to come back to my apartment. Because I was very, I was not sure what was going to happen. We had a new government, a new president who was absolutely not ashamed to say certain things you know, um, towards refugees. And now that uh, takes me to my other question. And by the way, for uh, thank you to everybody else watching us on YouTube, Facebook, um, as well as Twitter. Thank you. And please leave us a comment, a question um, in the comment section. And um, this is the last question for our panelists. And then um, we will be um, answering your questions now. Uh, this year, which is 2020, 2022, I almost said 2021, um, we had a lot about the Afghan and Ukrainian refugees. But it's my understanding that Black refugee stories were not really as much as documented as much with enthusiasm as we had seen with others. Um, now, what have you learned from the Americans and the world and how they treat certain refugees um, compared to others? Uh, Shukri. Um, I would say different, depending on, in my personal opinion, I would say different refugees are treated differently, if that makes any sense. Um, like, for example, I, I've observed in my life that, like, for example, certain refugees from Africa have a stereotype with them. So a lot of people, you know, they believe those stereotypes of those um, certain, like for example, a lot of a lot of African mothers, you know, that are single mothers that are coming with, you know, five, eight children. Um, there are also just, and those mothers have never had education. So when they try to seek education or when they try to better their lives, they're immediately like shut down and are told, you know, they're not given the right encouragement and the right tools to be able to succeed and I just feel like that's unfair um whereas some other people who have better understanding of the education system better understanding of education in general um are able to grab at these opportunities compared to some who have no clue of and I feel like there needs to be more education done to be able to level you know the um the opportunities and the education that's out there for everyone and it's not just specifically for example, um, 
like Afghan American, you know, at the Afghan refugees that are coming in right now, they're not black refugees. They're, you know, Afghans are considered white. They identify as white. So we just have to keep in mind our, you know, biases and personal, you know, beliefs and like racism and prejudice aside and realize that at the end of the day, these are people that are seeking, you know, um, better safety and better home mm-hmm. and just better opportunities in general. And I just think there needs to be no discrimination or racism when it comes to, you know, people of color and like African, just black people, black refugees. And um, you can even just, for example, there's people of color at the border that are not being let in sometimes because of their color. And you have some Ukrainians that are being let into the country because of their color so that Sometimes I feel like people try to dismiss the problem that is there or, you know, it, sometimes the problem seems hard to discuss to, or to even look at. And America has a long history of just tossing things under the table and, you know, arguing for, OK, you know, I'm colorblind. I don't see color. Of course you see color, you know, <laughs> and I just think it's important to speak the truth and to see things as they are and to not try to convince people of otherwise because at the end of the day these are things that we're seeing these are things that we are witnessing and um that's the reality of it amazing thank you habib do you want me to repeat the question um i think i got the gist of it uh, okay, I can I can go ahead and re- repeat it. So this year we heard a lot about the Afghan and Ukrainian refugees, mm-hmm. and then the black stories were not really documented much with in, uh, with much enthusiasm. Um, and what have you learned from the Americans and the world and how they treat certain, certain refugees compared to others? Yeah, it's it's like um, all refugees are equal, but some of them are definitely more equal than others. Um, it's that's a good one. You know, <laughs> um Better yeah, quote. Thank you. <laughs> I, I feel you know and I, I feel for the people of ukraine i feel for the people who've been displaced by this conflict you know it's never a, a good idea well never a good situation where your country is invaded and you have to well you have to leave because you know people are bombs are flying and uh, you know you're not sure if, if you can ensure the safety of your family and all that uh uh and i'm happy uh, for them that many of them were being able were uh, were welcomed with open arms in many countries uh in europe you know um but it's definitely very hard not to notice the contrast between how those refugees were treated and how refugees from you know let alone other places in africa uh, are treated um it's almost like there's this unspoken cultural and racial hierarchy in the disability of refugees. So if you look like me, talk like me, sound like me, sure, he can come in and, you know, I can shed tears for you if bombs are landing on your building. If you don't look like me and, you know, you have a Muslim sounding name and you're from far away, then, you know, um, there's a lot of mistrust, a lot of mistrust against people who are, um, coming from the from Africa, coming from the Muslim world. And if you are the intersection of both, especially, you're going to be at the bottom of the uh, of the hierarchy for the kind of person people want to see in their country. I, I even had a German guy say to me, you know, literally say to me in a conversation, why on earth would I want more African immigrants? You know, yeah. it's already, I'm just, okay, I'm, I'm done with you. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like you have to do so much work to prove not even that you're uh, amazing but just that, that hey I'm, I'm i'm a human being i'm just like you i'm not going yeah. to come here and try to bomb your country i'm not going to come and become a beggar or public charge i'm just trying to get the opportunity to be the best version of me i can be and to hopefully you know contribute to uh pay my fair share of taxes and you know helping the next generations of um you know, people in the country, wherever that might be, that 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 that, uh, that I'm welcome. Um, but yeah, um, the appetite for stories about African immigrants isn't especially high, or at the very least, it's not nearly as high as 
in the appetite when the refugees in question uh, have uh, blue eyes. That, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, at the same I, time, you know, um, I, I tend to think that you catch more flies with honey, honey than with vinegar, uh, which is great if you like flies. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's um, it's good to, I feel like it's good to praise it, to praise people when they do make an action in the right direction, right? When you, you see a story where you are, um, they're highlighting the plight of some African immigrants or refugees. It's good to say, ah, you know, good job, and to try to encourage people um, through praise rather than criticism. Because sometimes when people hear, nobody wants to hear that they're being discriminatory sometimes. And when you put that in people's faces, they tend to recall and they're done with the conversation pretty much, right? So, yes, yes, that's, that is my approach. You know, I, I am very proud of folks like you and others, authors and activists uh, from the black, different black communities across country that are showing, um, you know, uh, proving others wrong in terms of their way of thinking and perception towards, um, you know, black folks. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, I hear you. There's a few experiences um, that I could, I could also remember when it comes to people just, you know, with their eyes going wide open. It's like, wait, you wrote a book? You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Did you expect that only white people write books, right? Yeah. Um, now, we have questions, by the way, uh, from Facebook and YouTube. I hope you can see Laura. Um, thank you for this panel, Shukri Habib and Abdi. I really appreciate hearing your perspective. I have a question for the panelists. All right. It's for the two of you. As former refugees who have lived in the United States for a long time, what advice would you give to a refugee who has just arrived in the United States? Um, let's go with Shukri first. I would say there are opportunities, okay? <laughs> I just feel like it's always, instead of setting people up for failure, why don't you set them up for success, you know? And I just think I yes, personally indeed. believe that, like, there are opportunities. And for a new refugee that came here, I would tell them the sky's the limit, you know, um this country has abundance of different opportunities and different ways you can make your life better and there are good people here there are people who would who are willing to support you to reach your goals there are people who will you know defend you um but there are also struggles and there are also many different you know obstacles you'll you'll come across but at the end of the day i would tell them stay strong um this is your you know just take it as the opportunity to restart your life and to be able to say, okay, this is who I am and I am going in this direction. And you follow your, you know, follow your dreams, follow whatever it is that you want to do. And just understand that this is a great country at the end of the day. And um, only people can make it better. People can, it, it's all up to the people. And you could be the, you could take, there's different roads you can take and you could be the person who, you know, brings change about in this country and provide, you know, the same advice that, you know, or same things that I'm telling you to a new refugee that comes, you know, five, six, seven, you know, 20 years from now. And it's just always important to not forget where you're from and to remember your, um, your roots and where you're going to go. Uh, I will put that question back. <laughs> yeah. Probably, sorry, I took it off. Um, That's okay. Yes. So the question is, what advice do you have for refugees? Who yeah. just arrived in the um, for me, the main thing I would say is there's a lot of opportunities, but one of the absolute best thing you can do for yourself is get an education. Um, no matter what your age, no matter what your first language is, this country does a fantastic job of one allowing you or helping you acquire the language skills, right? There's uh, test taking uh, resources for people who need to do the TOEFL, uh, there is English as a second language classes, you know, if you're in high school, even in college, there are plenty of such opportunities. And once you get your English skills up to par, uh, your best way to financial, uh, well, to not being a financial burden, I guess, on the state, um, the, your best way to get to where you want to be financially is to get an education. And people have different aptitudes for different subjects. Um, but you, there are, if you're poor, there are some 
in this financial aid, you know, there is uh, there's Pell Grants, there is all kinds of opportunities. Um, you know, if you are able to study hard and you, you can even get some scholarships. And I know I was the recipient of those. So uh, for me, the path to well, salvation, so to speak, was, was definitely through education. Um, and there are a lot of people willing to go out of their way to help uh, teachers, professors, uh, counselors, whether in high school or in college, especially. Um, yeah, you know, if you have nobody else to talk to, talk to a guidance counselor, uh, go to a community college, make some phone calls, send some emails. There are people out there who are definitely willing to help you. And uh, yeah, I would not be able to be here today without those people. So that's my advice. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Now, Belinda has a qu question. Uh, what's a common misconception you all believe that people who have uh, people have about refugees? Shukri, you want to go first? Uh, sure. I would say um, there are different misconceptions. <laughs> It's getting late. It's 8 57. Okay. I know. And it's a Thursday night. But uh, I would say Yay was, for Friday. Um, some people just give up for I just see within like older refugees, they're more willing to help younger refugees than older refugees. And I just think that is just wrong and we shouldn't think that way. Regardless if you're 40 years old, I think you're able to you're able to get an education and be able to learn the language of this country and adapt and like, you know, prosper. But that would just be my misconception. Oh, the yeah. misconception that I see around, it would just be just thinking that refugees can't learn or, you know, they can't get educated. And that's just wrong because we are educated and we are yeah. up there. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I know we're running out of time. We have two more comments, but let's just be as brief as we can. <laughs> Habib, uh, you want to take this question? Same one? Yeah, sure. For me, again, the, it, it comes back to the same thing. The idea that a refugee is going to be a burden to the community that, that um, takes them in, that the community is going to have to give them food and give them you know, money and that they're not going to uh, be able to, to contribute to society. Whereas in reality, people who are refugees are some of the most resilient people you're going to meet in the world because they have survived you know, the most hardship and the quite often the most willing to work hard to get to financial independence and to contribute. And in the end, you're going to get people who are contributing much more to society than they took in uh, because you get somebody, get, you know, you help them get an education and a good job and they're going to be paying into the coffers of the government for decades afterwards, you know. Um, right. So that's my answer there. Fantastic. Um, now here's a quick question. Uh, as Black refugees, what's one thing that resettlement agencies like the CWS could do to help other Black refugees or um, amplify their voices? Uh, if you could be as brave as you can. Shukri? I would say um, better understanding, more education, um, more just being able to like improving translators, improving, you know, um, language barriers. I would say that's the main cause with like resettlement agencies um, and also just making sure that you're setting people up for success and you know you're giving them you're giving them the tools to succeed and understanding that these people can be independent and can work towards you know a lifelong of fulfillment and you just need to help them and believing in themselves and making sure that you know yeah great happy I would say a panel like this is a good is a good start, right? You need to yep. feature people who have come and who have succeeded in spite of the odds and who, you know, just are leading by example, so to speak. Uh, another thing, there are a lot of people who come here not speaking English or French or any other European language, making sure that the uh, resources that are available are not just geared towards people who speak English or French, but that, you know, if your first language is Swahili, if your first language is Bambara, that you have some way to tutor those people and to help them acquire the language skills, the education they're going to need to succeed. Amazing. Um, it's nine o'clock, guys, and I think Many of you actually answered, uh, sorry, so, so many of the things that you have said have already answered um, Krista's question. Um, but I would like to say that people could definitely follow you, follow up uh, to you. Uh, Shukri, you're on Facebook. Um, if people want to reach out for more questions, 
Um, Habib, you're definitely available. If anybody Googles your name, <laughs> lots of things come up. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. This was absolutely, absolutely amazing. I really, really enjoyed all the things that you have said. And I'm sure that everybody who's watching us tonight has felt the same way. I'm very proud of you guys. Thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. And um, hope I'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Who are refugees? Refugees are people just like you and me. People with lives, plans, and dreams for the future. But war, violence, and persecution have forced them to make an incredibly difficult choice. Some faced danger because of who they are and what they believe. Some are in danger because they spoke out on behalf of their neighbors who were marginalized. Others have watched as their homes were destroyed and their neighborhoods became war zones. All of them left everything behind for a chance at safety for themselves and their families. Once refugees arrive in a new country, they register with the United Nations Refugee Agency to access protection and other benefits. Some live in refugee camps. Many live in cities and towns, beginning new lives in their host countries. There are more than 80 million people who have been forcibly displaced from their homes. 26 million are refugees as defined by the UN. Less than 1% of refugees get the opportunity to be resettled in a third country like the United States. How do refugees get resettled in the United States? Although they have made it out of immediate danger, some particularly vulnerable refugees cannot remain in the country they fled to. These refugees may have urgent medical needs, be survivors of torture, or they may be in danger of further persecution. The UN Refugee Agency identifies the refugees who are most in need of resettlement to a safe third country, like the United States, and refers their cases to the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. These refugees undergo thorough background, biometric, security, and health screenings before being approved to travel to the United States. A regional resettlement support center provides information and classes to prepare them for life in the United States, and then their travel is booked. Each week, refugee resettlement agencies like CWS are assigned to the cases of arriving refugee families. As soon as these families arrive in the United States, we are there to welcome them to their new home and provide the services they need to rebuild their lives.